Apple is the world's largest technology company by revenue, as well as the most valuable brand in the world. As of 2020, more than 1.5 billion Apple products are actively in use, and they've played a massive role in shaping our modern world. Recently, a 4 to 1 stock split was announced for the company, making the stock more affordable to potential investors. In this video, I'm going to explain why Apple is one of the best dividend paying stocks and should be a staple in your long term dividend stock portfolio. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. My name is Zach and you should leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you enjoy the video. You should never invest in a business you don't understand. So in this video, I'm going to provide a full picture look at the business and stock history of Apple. Originally named Apple Computer, the company was founded in 1976 by Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Starting in Jobs' parents' garage, the duo built one of the most iconic success stories in American history. They practically invented the personal computer market, making major innovations in the space. Within a few years, the company became highly successful and would challenge established companies like IBM on the national stage. In 1984, they launched the Macintosh, which laid the groundwork for the future of computing. It was the first mass market personal computer to feature a graphical user interface and mouse for control. This revolutionized computers, making them simple to use and more accessible to the average person. Much of Apple's early success can be credited directly to the engineering of Steve Wozniak and the relentless pursuit and creativity of Steve Jobs. They focused on making the best possible product above all else. However, as Apple Computer grew, shareholder and business interests began to outweigh the founding values of the company. This led to Wozniak resigning in early 1985 after years of being unhappy with the company's direction. On top of this, shareholders began to resent Jobs due to his expensive projects into untested markets, eventually resulting in him being stripped of all his operational duties. Jobs resigned from Apple Computer in September of 1985, taking a number of employees with him to found Next. Following their exit, the company began to slowly decline as it strayed farther away from its roots. They began to sell countless product variations aiming to hit every price point in the market. This led to customer confusion and a reduction in overall quality. They launched many failed products such as digital cameras, portable CD audio players, speakers, video consoles, PDAs, and TV appliances. By 1997, Apple Computer was only weeks away from bankruptcy. This led to them acquiring Steve Jobs' company next and bringing back Jobs as CEO. During this time, the company was reborn, as Jobs not only completely revamped their product line, but brought back the culture that made Apple great. I've been back about uh, eight to ten weeks, and uh, we've been working really hard. Uh, and what we're trying to do uh, is, is not something really highfalutin. We're, we're trying to get back to the basics. And so we actually got rid of 70% of the stuff on the product road. I mean, I couldn't even figure out the damn product line after a few weeks. I, I kept saying, well, what is this model? How does this fit? And I started talking to customers and they couldn't figure it out either. And so you're going to see the product line get much simpler and you're going to see the product line get much better. Apple spends a fortune on advertising. You'd never know it. Our customers want to know who is Apple and what is it that we stand for. Apple at the core, its core value is that we believe that people with passion can change the world for the better. And that those people that are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that actually do. And so what we're going to do 
is to, is to get back to that core value. A lot of things have changed. The market's a totally different place than it was a decade ago. And Apple's totally different, and Apple's place in it is totally different. And believe me, the products and the distribution strategy and the manufacturing are totally different, and we understand that. But values and core values, those things shouldn't change. The things that Apple believed in at its core are the same things that Apple really stands for today. The product line was simplified and refocused on quality. We just can't ship junk. Most importantly, they started innovating again, re-establishing themselves as leaders in the technology space. In 2001, they launched the iPod, which revolutionized the way people listen to music. This sold over 100 million units in its first six years and proved that Apple was getting its swagger back. In 2007, the company rebranded from Apple Computer to Apple because they shifted focus from computers to consumer electronics more generally. That same year, they revealed a product that would change the future of the company and the entire world, the iPhone. Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. Well, today, we're introducing three revolutionary products of this class. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communication device. These are not three separate devices. This is one device, and we are calling it iPhone. Today, today Apple is going to reinvent the phone. Most advanced phones are called smartphones, and uh, the problem is that they're not so smart and they're not so easy to use. Well, we don't want to do either one of these things. What we want to do is make a leapfrog product that is way smarter than any mobile device has ever been and super easy to use. This is what iPhone is. What we're going to do is get rid of all these buttons and just make a giant screen. Now, how are we gonna communicate this? We don't wanna carry around a mouse, right? So what are we gonna do? We're gonna use the best pointing device in the world. We're gonna use a pointing device that we're all born with. We're born with 10 of them. We're gonna use our fingers. And we have invented a new technology called multi-touch. We've been very lucky to have brought a few revolutionary user interfaces to the market in our time. First was the mouse. The second was the click wheel. And now we're going to bring multi-touch to the market. And each of these revolutionary user interfaces has made possible a revolutionary product. The Mac, the iPod, and now the iPhone. The iPhone revolutionized the smartphone and you could argue is the single most influential device of all time. The product remains the cornerstone of Apple's business today and is just one of the countless products launched during the second coming of Steve Jobs. On August 24, 2011, Jobs resigned from the position of CEO due to his declining health and was replaced by Tim Cook. A few months later, Jobs passed away, leaving the company without any of their founders once again. Luckily, the culture that Steve Jobs implemented stayed with the company long after his death. Since his passing, they've launched countless successful products and have grown to become the largest technology company by revenue and the world's most valuable brand. Tim Cook has continued the success of Apple and you can tell he has a great deal of respect for the culture that Jobs aimed to permeate throughout the company. There's not a day that goes by that we don't think about him. Steve's spirit and timeless philosophy on life will always be the DNA of Apple. We think different. Mm -hmm. You remember that, I do. and that is still embedded in Apple very, very deeply. You have to come up with a different way of viewing the problem. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes that is the hardest part of all of it, is to, leave, is to think out of box, to, to think different. Today, Apple offers a myriad of products across many sectors of the consumer electronics market. I won't go into heavy detail regarding each individual product because that would just be excessive, 
Instead, I'll go through each of their product categories, discuss their performance based on Q3 earnings, and detail their newest developments. The iPhone is the largest sector of the company, making up 44.3% of total revenue. It's grown 1.66% year over year and continues to pump out consistent profits. Every year they refresh their product line and continue to innovate with new features. In the US, the iPhone represents 46% of the smartphone market share as of 2020. This makes it the top US smartphone by a wide margin. Globally, it consistently ranks third with 14% of the market share as of 2020. Apple has built massive customer loyalty through their ecosystem, quality, and ease of use. I think this is by far Apple's most defensible source of revenue. Just speaking from personal experience, once I got an iPhone, I was so satisfied that I no longer even considered other phones as options. This is the greatest compliment you can give to any product. I plan on purchasing exclusively iPhones unless something drastic happens to the platform, and I don't think I'm alone in that. The second largest sector of Apple is their services, which make up 22% of total revenue. It's growing by 14.85% year over year and will be a large part of the company's future. The services sector is made up of Apple Music, the App Store, the Mac App Store, iCloud, iTunes, Apple Pay, Apple Care, Apple News Plus, Apple Arcade, and licensing. Two newer developments in this area are the Apple Card and Apple TV Plus. Apple Card is a credit card designed to integrate seamlessly with their Apple Pay system. As of March 2020, about 3.1 million people have the Apple credit card, which represents 2.2% of all US adults with a credit card. Its users are mostly young, with 70% of card members being millennials. On top of this, 60% of those with an Apple card consider it to be their primary credit card. This is downright impressive given the card has been out for under a year and they offered no sign up bonus, which is standard in the credit card industry. It looks like Apple Card will become a significant source of revenue for decades to come. Apple TV Plus is their new streaming service, which is focused around developing high quality original content. It costs $4.99 a month, making it more affordable than most streaming services. Originally, it was intended only to have programming developed exclusively by Apple. However, after a slow launch, they are pivoting to license older content. This will build a back catalog that will help them compete against competitors with larger libraries such as Netflix, Hulu, and Disney+. This pivot is an acknowledgement of slow growth relative to their competitors. That being said, Apple TV Plus still has a massive potential, especially when you consider how it will be integrated in the Apple ecosystem. The services sector of Apple seems prime for expansion, and I wouldn't be surprised if in the future it overtakes iPhone as Apple's largest sector. The third largest sector of Apple is the Mac, which makes up 11.9% of total revenue. It has seen 21.63% year-over-year growth and continues to be a strong part of the company. The product line contains the MacBook Air, MacBook Pro, the iMac, the Mac Mini, and the Mac Pro. They continue to refresh these product lines and make innovations to keep them at the top of the industry. They recently launched a new MacBook Air, 13-inch MacBook Pro, and Mac Mini. These launches fueled massive growth in Q3 as about half of the Mac purchases in the quarter were new to Mac entirely. This is a fantastic sign as Macs typically have unparalleled brand loyalty. So not only are they retaining customers, but gaining new ones as well. The Macintosh line will continue to be a massive part of Apple for decades to come. The fourth largest sector of Apple is iPad, which makes up 11% of total revenue. It has seen 31.04% year-over-year growth and continues to be a strong performer for the company. Their product line contains iPad Pro, the iPad Air, the iPad, and the iPad Mini. This offers high-quality Apple experiences at a range of price points, making it accessible for many different types of customers. In Q3, two out of three customers who purchased an iPad were completely new to iPad. This is a great sign as it shows the customer market for iPad is still growing by a significant margin. Their newest product in this category is the iPad Pro, which aims to be the ultimate computer replacement. I have a feeling that the iPad market may just be getting started. 
The smallest sector of Apple is their wearables, home devices, and accessories, which make up 10.8% of total revenue. It has seen 16.74% year-over-year growth, but is just scratching the surface of its potential. This product line contains the Apple Watch, AirPods, AirPods Pro, Apple TV, the HomePod, and countless accessories. The Apple Watch makes up 55% of the global smartwatch market and has become a dominant player in the health industry. I recently purchased an Apple Watch to track my running and I was blown away by its utility. The Apple Watch is not only price competitive with other fitness trackers, but is in a league of its own with overall functionality. Like my experience with the iPhone, I will no longer consider other options going forward because I'm genuinely satisfied with the product. Likewise, AirPods have dominated the headphone space, becoming the default headphone among iPhone users. This sector, like all others, will continue to grow and be a massive part of Apple's business going forward. The power of Apple comes from its brand. Through decades of building trust with customers and world-famous advertising campaigns, Apple has become the most valuable brand in the world. This forms a massive economic moat around the business as brand loyalty helps them retain market share and charge a premium for their products. Also, the Apple ecosystem of products and software have become so deeply integrated that there is now a high switching cost for a user. This means that the customer is incentivized to stay with the company as they will lose all the seamless integration between products if they leave. On top of this, the company still retains the exceptional culture it was founded with. All of these factors mean Apple may have one of the strongest moats of any company. Given that the idea of the economic moat was popularized by Warren Buffett, it makes sense that he would heavily invest in Apple. In fact, Apple is his largest holding by market value. I'll let Warren himself explain why he's invested in Apple. I, I do not focus on the sales in the next quarter or the next year. I, I focus on the, they won't tell you exactly how many, but hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of people who practically live their lives by it. That is some of the most valuable real estate in the world. I mean, that is, Fifth, Fifth Avenue will never come close to that. I mean, it, it is, you've got, you've got hundreds and hundreds of millions of people with loads of buying power and able to do business uh, or learn information or whatever it may be. And they and it's part of their habit of living. I mean, they spend hours a day and it does all kinds of things for them. So that, that, that real estate is, is worth a fortune. The iPhone is enormously underpriced. Now it's got competition, so you can't push the price. But in terms of its utility to people and what they get for $1,000 someplace else, you know, it, it, you're gonna have a dinner party. It <laughs> costs that, and, and here this is, and what it does for you, it's incredible. All right, so now that we understand the business fundamentals of Apple, it's time to look at the stock as a dividend investor. On July 30th, Apple announced that the company will do a four to one stock split effective by the end of August. This means that since Apple trades around $425 a share, it will be priced at about $106 after the split. This makes the stock more affordable to investors who can't purchase fractional shares. So what happens if you already own a share of Apple? In this case, every one share you own will simply be split into four separate shares. I've noticed online that many people are confused by how this affects the dividend. The dividend payout total remains constant, meaning it will proportionally see a four to one split along with the stock. For example, Apple currently has a $3.28 annual payout for their dividend. So after the split, each share would have an 82 cent annual payout. So to reiterate, everything will split proportionally and the dividend yield will remain the same per share. With that news out of the way, let's dive deeper into Apple's numbers. The company has seen consistent revenue growth. Over the last five years, the revenue has increased from 182.8 billion to 260.2 billion, which gives it a 7.3% five-year compound annual growth rate. This growth is consistent with profit increases as over the last five years, the profit has grown from 70.5 billion to 98.4 billion. This makes the five-year compound annual growth rate of profit to be 6.8% in line with revenue increases. The Apple dividend has seen seven years of dividend growth, a 10.49% five-year growth rate, and a current 0.77% dividend yield. The payout ratio is extremely low at 26%, giving it lots of room for dividend growth. I'd expect the Apple dividend to continue to grow at a generous rate for decades to come. 
On July 30th, Apple released their Q3 earnings and it beat expectations by a wide margin. On top of this, they announced the stock split on the same day. This sent the stock price soaring to an all-time high of $425. This incredibly high price makes the dividend yield extremely low at 0.77%, especially in comparison to historical yields. So right now is one of the poorest starting yields you can purchase Apple at ever. However, the high dividend growth rate still makes it a compelling long-term investment. The fundamentals of Apple are ridiculously strong, and if you can get the stock at a fair price, then I think it's the best dividend-paying stock in the technology sector. Right now, I don't own any Apple stock due to the fact I thought it's been at a high price since I started my dividend portfolio back in January. Little did I know the price would only continue to skyrocket from there. If you've followed my monthly portfolio updates, then you know that the technology sector is only 3% of my portfolio, and I'm looking to improve that allocation. It's become apparent that technology stocks like Apple have some of the safest dividends, especially in the conditions of a pandemic-induced economic shutdown. This is an important factor, as when I'm building my dividend income, I not only want it to have high growth potential, but to be extremely reliable in the long term. I've identified Apple as the highest quality technology dividend stock with a fantastic balance of growth potential and reliability. So what's my plan on growing a position in Apple? I plan on implementing a dollar cost averaging strategy with a slight twist. I will begin to implement this strategy after the stock split as my investing platform does not allow for the purchase of fractional shares. My strategy is to purchase one share every month while trying to optimize the price when possible. So when setting my monthly order, I'm going to take the high and low of the previous month and try to set my order in the lower quarter of prices from that period. On top of this, I'm going to be following the stock price like a hawk and try to get the company at a good value. If I'm lucky, maybe some phones will catch on fire and I can swoop up some shares at a deal. <laughs> so this is my current strategy for buying Apple. However, don't take my advice blindly and be sure to do your own research before making any investment decisions. Thank you for watching Dividend Data. I'd greatly appreciate it if you could leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Every month you'll get a breakdown of my long-term dividend stock portfolio and every week get a video like this. If you follow me on Twitter, link in the description, you can get real-time updates of my buys and dividends coming in. I'm launching a Patreon where you can support the channel. Here you can gain access to my personal spreadsheet, chat with other viewers, and have your name displayed at the end of every video as a premium supporter of the channel. The link is in the description. Please leave a comment below Hello and thank you for watching. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes.